Letter 20. My dear Wormwood, I note with great displeasure that the enemy has, for the time being, put a forcible end to your direct attacks on the patient's chastity. You ought to have known that he always does in the end, and you ought to have stopped before you reached that stage. For as things are, your man has now discovered the dangerous truth that these attacks don't last forever. Consequently, you cannot use again what is, after all, our best weapon, the belief of ignorant humans, that there is no hope of getting rid of us except by yielding. I suppose you've tried persuading him that chastity is unhealthy? I haven't yet got a report from you on young women in the neighborhood. So he's referencing here the ideas that he gave to Wormwood in the past few letters regarding love and sexuality and seeing like what's been going on with all of that. And it appears that things are not going well for Wormwood in those areas. So Screwtape's gonna offer a few more bits of advice. I haven't yet got a report from you on young women in the neighborhood. I should like it at once, for if we can't use his sexuality to make him unchaste, we must try to use it for the promotion of a desirable marriage. In the meantime, I would like to give you some hint about the type of woman, I mean the physical type, which he should be encouraged to fall in love with if falling in love is the best we can manage. In a rough and ready way, of course, this question is decided for us by spirits far deeper down in the lower archy than you and I. It is the business of these great masters to produce in every age a general misdirection of what may be called sexual taste. This they do by working through the small circle of popular artists, dressmakers, actresses, and advertisers who determine the fashionable type. So what this letter is really about is what people perceive to be beauty. What is beauty? What is the perfect woman? What does that look like according to the world? The aim is to guide each sex away from those members of the other with whom spirituality, helpful happiness, and fertile marriages are most likely. Thus, we have now for many centuries triumphed over nature to the extent of making certain secondary characteristics of the male, such as the beard, disagreeable to nearly all the females. And there is more in that than you might suppose. As regards to the male taste, we have a varied a good deal. At one time, we had directed it to statuesque and aristocratic type of beauty, mixing men's vanity with their desires and encouraging the race to breed chiefly from the most arrogant and prodigal woman. At another, we have selected exaggeratedly feminine type, faint and languishing, so that folly and cowardice and all the general falseness and littleness of mind which go with them shall be at a premium. At present, we are on the opposite tact. The age of jazz has succeeded the age of the waltz, and we now teach men to like women whose bodies are scarcely distinguishable from those of boys. Since this is a kind of beauty even more transitory than most, we thus aggravate the female's chronic horror of growing old, with many excellent results, and render her less willing and less able to bear children. And that is not all. We've engineered a great increase in the license which society allows to the representation of the apparent nude, not the real nude, in art, and its exhibition on the stage or bathing beach. It is all a fake, of course. The figures in popular art are falsely drawn. Which is so interesting, right? This is being written in the 1940s, and yet we think about models in today's magazines, they're airbrushed, right? They've been photoshopped. They're not, they're not real. Those are not real women's bodies a lot of time. And the same was in C.S. Lewis's time, just a bit different. He's talking about in art, right? It's, those are not their real bodies either. The real women in bathing suits or tights are actually pinched in and propped up to make them appear firmer and more slender and more boyish than nature allows a full-grown woman to be. Yet at the same time, the modern world is taught to believe that it is being frank and healthy and getting back to nature. As a result, we are more and more directing the desires of men to something which does not exist, making the role of the eye in sexuality more and more important and at the same time making it demands more and more impossible. What follows, you can easily forecast. So what he's talking about in this letter is how, yes, the standards of beauty over time have changed, right, with each century or with each decade, um, right, like how thin you are or how curvy you are, right? One decade it's in, one decade the next one's in. And, you know, we're always trying to attain that when that is not a lot of times what our actual body type is, but we are allowing the world to tell us that that is how we should look. And that doesn't come from God, 
right? That's not what the Bible has to say about beauty. You look at scripture verses um, such as Proverbs 31:30 or 1 Peter 3, 3 through 4, these are not telling you how exactly you are supposed to look. And God is not pleased if, you know, we starve ourselves to be super skinny or unpleased with us if we don't have curves or anything in between, right? Because that's, we are created in his image. And those doubts that we have about how we look aren't coming from God, right? They're coming from Satan. And so it's interesting that C.S. Lewis includes a chapter about that in his book. That is the general strategy of the moment, but inside that framework, you will still find it possible to encourage your patient's desires in one of two directions. You will find, if you look carefully into any human's heart, that he is haunted by at least two imaginary women, a terrestrial, a down-to-earth, and a diabolical or loose woman, an infernal fe Venus, and that his desire differs qualitatively according to its object. There is one type for which his desire is such as to be naturally amenable to the enemy, readily mixed with charity, readily obedient to marriage, colored all through with that golden light of reverence and naturalness which we detest. There is another type which he desires brutally, and desires to desire brutally, a type best used to draw him away from marriage, although but which, even within marriage, he would tend to treat as a slave, an idol, or an accomplice. His love for the first might involve what the enemy calls evil, but only accidentally. The man would wish that she was not someone else's wife and be sorry that he could not love her lawfully. But in the second type, the felt evil is what he wants, that is the tang and the flavor which he is after. In the face, it is the visible animality or sulkiness or craft or cruelty which he likes, and in the body, something quite different from what he ordinarily calls beauty, something he may even in a sane hour describe as ugliness, but which by our art can be made to play on the raw nerve of his private obsession. Basically, C.S. Lewis says that men a lot of times identify women as one of two types of like caricatures, right? They put us in one or two categories and that's either kind of like the natural, wholesome girl next door or the wild, mysterious, wanton, kind of loose woman. And there's nothing in between, right? We're not individualized. We're always stereotyped as one or the other. And so here Lewis is addressing those two types of stereotypes that we often find ourselves in. The real use of the infernal Venus is, no doubt, as prostitute or mistress. But if your man is a Christian and if he has been well trained in nonsense about irresistible and all excusing love, he can often be induced to marry her, and that is very well worth bringing about. You will have failed as regards fornification and solitary vice, but there are other and more indirect methods of using a man's sexuality to his undoing. And by the way, they are not only efficient, but delightful. The unhappiness produced is of a very lasting and exquisite kind. Your affectionate uncle, Screwtape. <laughs>